Welcome to the Weekly Juice Podcast, where we discuss all things real estate, personal finance, investing, entrepreneurship, and the many ways to achieve financial independence. We interview accomplished investors and entrepreneurs with the goal that their stories inspire you to take control of your financial future. Here to get your creative juices flowing while also documenting their own personal investing journeys are your hosts, Corey Jacobson and Ryan Bevilacqua. Welcome back to the Wealth Juice Podcast. As always, it's your boys, Ryan and Corey here with another episode for you. Today, we interviewed Grace Gudenkoff. She is a real estate investor living currently in Arizona, but invests and has most of her portfolio in Iowa. She is 26 years old, has 27 units under her belt, has a mix between uh, long-term rentals, midterm, and then she's done a lot of creative finance deals. Um, And funny enough, we have the same creative finance coach, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. But Grace is also the founder of the Wire Community, uh, Women Invest in Real Estate. Her partner is Amelia McGee, and they co-wrote a book called The Self-Managing Landlord, published by Bigger Pockets. So they're doing some big things in the real yeah, estate. Yeah, and community. she's so young. And like she she started she bought real estate when she was 22, she started. So to have 26, 27 units at by that age, um, she talks about her competitive advantage being that she grew up in eastern Iowa. Um, she started buying deals there. And by the way, for people that are listening, there's still deals out there for ninety thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars. Like you can do it. She did it. She now moved away to Arizona and Tucson. And she lives there because she said if she stayed any longer, she, that she was she she was so f- involved in the actual DIY stuff. And that was like her thing. She's like, I would have just done it forever. So I needed to remove myself from the business. She hired an in-house property manager, an in-house project manager. She's really become this CEO of her lifestyle and her business. And that's some of the things we touch on here. But I think this episode, first of all, creative financing. And if you're listening, Jen and Joe Delafave, they've taught us a lot. They, they taught her. She was mentored by them. There's a link in our Instagram bio we talk about in the in the episode to book a call with them if you want to learn how to buy 26 units by 26 years old. Again, doesn't matter how old you are, but that that was a fun part of it. But as we move towards like the middle and the end, I thought it was um, just exciting to talk about kind of like a little bit of the why, but also like you know maybe spend your money a little bit earlier than you thought. Like like you're building wealth, you're spending so much time and effort and energy, and like don't be a hoarder. Like try to figure out ways to to, to, I'm pointing to the screen because I'm saying that Grace is going to, uh, she was just got, got home from vacation from Europe, she said, and she didn't check her email for two weeks. She's set up her life that way. And then in a year, I think her and her partner are going to go to, she mentioned Columbia. I'm not sure if that's actually where they're going, but for four months, they're going to travel. And it's, it's just cool to see that somebody that's like so young, that's doing that type of thing. Yeah. I think whether you're a new listener, um, or an old listener that's been listening forever, you'll you'll come to realize a lot of our second half of the episodes, we get more into like philosophical stuff and like talking about personal things that are going on in our lives. And you know, that might be reversed for some people and other shows, but what I, it gets us so excited because you realize there's so much relatability and people are going through the same things and, and, and the same trials, tribulations, wins and losses. Like real estate is very, it's forgiving, but you're, you realize that people are, they're the same of the, there's some of the same issues going on some of the pain, same pain points and it's cool to talk about them and i think one of the number one things we hit on towards the end was community and how important that is to get yourself around people that have done it before you that want to do what you're doing and you just elevate together but it really gives you a sense of purpose and passion and like to go through the journey with others and finding your people right i think a lot of us sometimes get stuck at our whether it's a job or in, in rooms with family or whatever it might be and you're like oh man like they don't like what I like. They're not talking about what I want. Like, how do I find those people? Corey and I were fortunate enough to find each other. We have a partnership. And then it's like broadening that now. We have over 200 plus people that we can go out to from our previous episodes that are doing it. But like building that community and bringing people in, that's why we created our community, why Grace created hers, Women Invest in Real Estate. There's just so many out there. And I think it's it's just fun to do things together. And you realize like, why am I doing all this anyways? Like, let's have fun along the way. Yeah, with let's other enjoy people. it with with the people that are like minded, that think like I do. You know, you don't. They they show like mo- shows and movies of people sitting in an office in a cubicle. Like, that's only that you might only have to do that for a small part of your life, or not at all. You don't need to go through the the mud and eat dirt. Like, you can join a community and find people that are thinking the way that you are. Ours, others depends on what you like, but that this episode talks about all that. And I, and she's and Grace's 
she's just like so advanced for, I keep going back to her age. I mean, age is just a number, but she's just so advanced. She's, she has more personal real estate than Ryan and I have. I mean, we have a bunch of units, but we have them in partnership. So to watch somebody do it, that's younger, it's inspiring. You know, it's like, it's just, a, it's just a cool thing. So it's one of those, yeah, once again, uh, kind of reminds me of the Jesse Ray story. And I'm sure you guys have listened to that episode. If you haven't, it's the growth house episode, a couple back, but Grace was like, I listened to your show and I, I, this is actually I one that to I be on. really wanted to be on. And we're like, <laughs> damn, like we did it again. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's awesome to hear that because we're hearing it from someone that listened to years ago and look at their portfolio. Like we've done, and I'm not tooting horns here, but it's just a really cool full circle moment for Corey and I. It's like, we've done this for free for years and it's awesome to see people's lives are impacted. And I just can't, her story is incredible. She's motivating, but she's very level-headed and has systems and processes narrowed down for people that are like, okay, I want to know the how, where can I go? So tune into this full episode, gets really fun at the end. And uh, yeah, let's bring her in. Let's do it. It's time to flip the script on how you invest in real estate. Backflip is one company out there that is actually changing the game. Backflip is an all-in-one platform that gives you the insights, capital, and community to find and fund your fix and flip real estate deals. The app is completely free. And actually, the part Ryan and I love the most is you can pull comps, estimate profits for multiple exit strategies in seconds, and apply for a personalized loan all in one place. We're talking a 96% loan-to-cost ratio and no upfront fees. Check it out for yourself. Download the Backflip app today. Having purchased investment properties as well as primary residences, we know how daunting it can be to find a reliable lender to secure financing for real estate in the market today. With the up and down in the market, high interest rates, and the complexity of the process, honestly, it can feel like a lot. So to help out our community, we decided to bring on probably the most important person or one of the most important members of our personal real estate investing team onto the show to help out our listeners. Our mortgage lender, Travis David of CMG Home Loans, has agreed to educate our community and assist anyone looking for real estate financing. Whether you're a real estate investor looking to fund your next project or simply looking to purchase the primary residence, Travis will be able to help you and point you in the right direction. So he provides each of his clients with a tailored roadmap designed to guide them through purchasing their first investment property and strategically scale their portfolios over time. So if you're looking to either purchase your first residence or maybe second residence, but a primary residence or invest in real estate, Travis is your guy. Visit our website at www.juice-enterprises.com forward slash need dash funding to book a call with Travis to explore all the loan packages that him and his team currently have available. He'll also help assess your current situation and will work with you to map out a plan for the future. So just remember this, we can all win. Uh, this is an example we really wanted to help out our community and something we find people are lacking in a daunting process. So if you are looking for real estate financing, we have your back. Make sure to visit our website and Travis will take care of you. Quick public service announcement for all of our listeners. First off, we want to thank you all for tuning into the show, not only this week, but we've seen you coming back episode after episode. And one thing we'd really like your assistance on, if possible, you know that our content's free and it takes a lot to pump this out every week. We're really looking to enhance our overall reviews on the show. That can be on Spotify, but mainly we are looking for Apple Podcasts. If you could please leave us a five-star review, that will go so long and so far for us. Um, really, when people are looking to get on shows, they look to see how many five-star re reviews that show has and the number of reviews. So if you haven't left one, please just click on our show, you can scroll down to reviews and then leave the five star. Even if you can write a little blurb about us, like what maybe has helped motivate you or anything that is relatable to your life, that would go such a long way for us. And then in turn, it allows us to get high quality guests for future episodes. So if there's been a motivating episode that you can really think back to and that has really helped you in your life, please leave a review because we'll be able to get someone like that on the show in the future to help someone else out. So that would be very much appreciated. And we look forward to continuing more episodes for you. Grace, officially welcome to the Wealth Juice Podcast. Corey and I are so excited to have you on the show. We have been waiting a long time to get you on here. You have an incredible story, new book out, and we're just excited to share your story with our listeners. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on this show because I've listened lots. Thank we you. We were excited to hear that, that you listened to us and that, that this is one that you wanted to be on. So Yeah, that, cool. was, that was nice. That's cool. It's, uh, it's, I don't know. <laughs> it's cool to hear from... It's, I don't know, just watching people's journeys evolve and like not knowing there's so many blips on the radar and not knowing who's impacted and stuff. So it's, it's really cool. But Grace, if you could take us back, let's talk pre-real estate, what you did prior and then kind of when the light bulb went off and you're like, whoa, hmm, I'm kind of interested in this. And 
you can take us all the way up to your 26 plus yeah. units and your wire community and you're, you're killing it. So take us through the journey. Well, thank you. I think growing up, I always knew I wanted to have a business, but I never knew what the heck that was. I was always pretty good with numbers. I studied mechanical engineering in college, and I also got a Spanish degree, neither of which I use currently, <laughs> which is funny. And I always knew I would do something. I didn't know what. During COVID, my significant other flipped a house. And I remember I was in college painting his house. And I thought to myself, like, maybe I'll do this someday, but I have no idea when. Then I graduated, I got a good job, and I was like, I got to put this money to use. I got to be smart with this engineering salary. Decided, oh, I guess I can qualify for a house. I should house hack. And then slowly that happened, and I realized, wow, if other people can do this, I can do this. We started DIY, my partner and I, and then pretty quickly, within like a few months, I was like, I really want to do this full time. Yeah. So, you, I mean, it's kind of nonchalant of you there, but you were 22 when you started. Well, you're 26 now, 26 units. So you've done, you know, five or six a year. The question I think a lot of people would have when they listen to somebody say that is, how are you able to scale so fast? Like for some people that could be slow, right? We know people that bought a 55 unit on their first deal, right? That's, that's kind of like super, super out of the norm. Ryan and I bought one here, duplex here, other one here. And then we went into like larger multifamily, but we're not the sole owners of it. So to hear somebody go from one to 26 units in four years where you're, you and your partner, right? Are sole owners. How, like, what was the strategy? Like, how did you springboard? What was the, the moves you made? I would say two things. One, keep in mind, I'm in Eastern Iowa. I'm all in for my single family homes under like $120,000. So I'm not talking about buying half million dollar single family homes. And I feel like when people hear 26 units, they think that's $10 million. It's not. It's like two and a half, three million dollars max. Like there's the purchase price really helped there that I didn't have to have that much money to start. And then the other thing was, very quickly, I started listening to bigger pockets, like most people. And I remember I heard somebody say, if you find a good deal, don't let the money stop you. And don't ever let the money stop you. And I remember I just turned to my partner, and he doesn't work in our business at all anymore. Um, he actually went back to an engineering job. But at the beginning, he was very DIY doing a lot of the contracting work. And I looked at him and I said, what if we did that? What if we just found deals and then we'd figure out how the heck to buy it? And that's what we did. Our money only lasted like two deals. But then I started creative financing, burr, private money to figure out how the heck can I buy all these really good deals. So we were talking before the we started recording and, and you said you lived in Tucson. I'm very curious how you got to Eastern Iowa and or did you live there at one point? And the reason why I asked the question, I kind of teeing it up is because when people say, oh, well, you know, everyone makes an excuse and they'll be like, well, Grace lives in Eastern Iowa and it's in her backyard and she can buy a property for a hundred thousand. I live in New York city. It's like, well, dude, there's people investing all over the country, right. picking niches in every market, every sing exactly every single market. I mean, we know people, several people who live in Florida, Texas, you know, Arizona that invest in the Midwest. Um, I'm not sure how the people in the Midwest feel about that, but that's America. So what, mm -hmm. like, how Eastern Iowa, like, how did you get there or did you grow up there? I don't know. We didn't get to that part of your story. I grew up and was born and raised there until I moved to Tucson. So the first, I've only been in Tucson for one year. So the first two, three years of real estate, I was there. I never even knew that you could invest anywhere outside of your backyard. So when I got started, I was like, oh, duh, I'm going to invest in Cedar Rapids because this is where I live. Got it. Yeah. So let's talk about. I think that price point is is insane, right? Are these properties? And let's let's kind of pick through the portfolio a little bit. We can get to the entire portfolio, but I'm just curious because I'm sure people are thinking like, "Wow, hundred thousand dollar price point? That's pretty insane." And mm -hmm. thinking about how little you need down on something like that is wild, even at twenty percent. So, how are these cash flowing in terms of like today? Has it changed over the last couple of years? Because I know you're still, you know, the journey's not been that long. So give us kind of like how this portfolio performs. You mentioned about 3 million bucks um, invested, you know, or not invested, but like assets under management. So mm -hmm. I'm curious on cash flow monthly. Yeah. So for single family homes, when I first started, I was looking for two, 300 bucks um, a door. So not anything crazy, just a solid 
purchase, but I, anything I do, I always do like a perfect burr. Like I don't ever have to leave money in deals, which is really nice. Cause also part of being investing where you're born and raised is I get so much off market deals by word of mouth. Cause I'm, you guys said you're a small fish in a big pond. I'm like, I'm the big fish in the very, very small pond. And I love it. Cause I don't want to compete with people. I want to be the competition. Um, and we can talk more about that. But yeah, single family homes, I'm buying for like 80, 90, put 20, 30, maybe 40 into it. And then it's going to rent for well over the 1% rule. Obviously now with 7, 8% interest rates, it's not going to be as great. But I'm still just trying to remind myself, this is a long-term game. Single family homes are not going to make you rich. They're to be there for you in 20 years when you pay it off and fund your retirement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was going to ask you the question on how the, the the changing of the interest rates has changed your business at all. I'm curious if it has. And 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 to me, what you, it sounds like they're just slightly less good deals, but they're still good deals, right? I don't know if that's in markets with larger properties or higher. Um, let me say, like a uh, bigger properties that are worth more. It's actually you get squeezed more. You know, the the, yeah. the cash flows are not there, but in in buying a ninety thousand dollar home, if you're going to burn it, I assume you're buying it in cash, so you're not dealing with the bank until the refi. Is that the case? Correct. Yeah, the interest rates. I started flipping actually the first three years. I never sold a thing. I kept everything. I was scared to sell stuff. I thought it was forbidden. And then about a year ago, I hired a full time project manager because I was like, I'm terrible at project managing, but I want to have a real a big real estate business, so it's time to hire. And since then we've done eight flips in 10 months and my goal for 2024 is to do 15 total but that's because of interest rates and because i'm trying to build my active income i'm gonna be rich in 25 years i'm good there i yeah, want well, the active income now <laughs> nothing wrong with being rich when you're 50 years old right so <laughs> yeah. I, I i'm noticing some distinct differences between us and here's one we got to like six units and we're like, we're not self-managing. This is no shot. I don't want to put any, I, I, I don't want to do this. I want to pay a property manager because I want it to be more passive. You wrote a book on self-managing, you know, <laughs> uh, the self-managing landlord. So how do you manage the 26 units? And then wh why did you decide to do the self-managing? I know it keeps more money in your pocket, but to us, it feels a lot less passive. You're a systems and processes gal. How does that play, you know, into your business? So I'm a self-manager in the terms that I employ my own property manager. I don't know my tenants' names. Just today, I hired a new property manager today, yesterday. About a year ago, I hired one person to be full-time project and property, and now I've split him. So he's full-time project management, my flips, and I have a full-time property manager who started yesterday. And she was like, hey, I know one of your tenants. They were in my wedding. And I said, who? And she said the names and I was like, I'm not going to lie. I have no clue who that is. Like, I don't know my tenants names at this point because I've hired it in house. So in the book, I really talk about do it DIY from the start to have, you know, better profit, but also the quality and it's a marketable skill that you can then take into bigger deals. Like maybe if you wanted to take down a 20 unit and go 50, 50 with somebody being able to save 10% on property management fees and for you to do it is a huge asset to another partner. And in fact, Amelia, who was on your show, she has a deal like that, but I'm all about keep it in house. I don't trust these other companies. They manage 500 properties at once. My actual first property manager came from a business. He was 20 years old and was managing like 400 properties on his own. Yeah, we <laughs> we met a, a guy. I don't know if you know if he's on social anymore. But in Cleveland, who was managed, who was doing property management. And he managed like Ian managed like four hundred on his own too. And it was it's a that is a tough business. So I like the it's idea tough. of actually like bringing in a property manager to do it for you. The systems and processes that you put in place to run it like mm -hmm. you would. At what point? You know, a couple questions. D do you pay this person based on each property? Is it just a regular salary, or you know, like how do you I guess make that worth not paying my while. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, worth your while. <laughs> exactly. Well, my first person I hired at 20 bucks an hour, 10 hours a week. I did that for about a year. She just did like paperwork and maintenance coordination because I still was making, I, w I also quit my job, side note, so early into my career, I had to self manage. 
like, and also when I started in real estate, it never occurred to me to hire a company because I was like, I will do way better than you guys will. And I want every dollar so I can quit my job. Then when I quit, I started to realize, how can I outsource this without sending it to a big company who's going to do a shitty job? And part of that aha moment was I bought an eight unit and it was managed by one of the quote unquote premier property managers. And I walked into that deal. There was so much money on the table through the mismanagement. I was like, there's no like missed pet fees, under market rents, not charging for parking, like all these things. And I was like, wait, you guys are professionals at this. I'm 23 years old and I'm coming in here and I'm going to increase the value of this eight unit by 50 grand just by adding in the pet fees or whatever. So that was a huge part of it. And then now I wanted to build it in house. Yeah. And that makes no sense. So you can't be a good property management company because your incentive is to drive up all the money that you can get, all the rents and everything so that you can get paid on all of it too. Like take the 10% of your, so that's. Right. They just probably didn't have the bandwidth to even know that they were leaving that on the table. Yeah. I'm curious about the, I know Rock probably has a bunch of questions too here, but I'm curious about if you were telling somebody to like, and this may be in your book, but to do what you're doing, would you recommend somebody that lives in a hotter market to go try to buy property in the Midwest? Or do you think you had such a competitive advantage in your backyard that you would try to do that anywhere first before trying to buy across the country? And I asked the question because there's many people that we've interviewed on the pod who do, who do, who like, I, I mean, solely for example, right? She was in California. I don't know if she still lives in California. I think she does, but she invests in Cincinnati. And it's like, she never lived in Cincinnati. She said that like she had partners that did. So there's, you know, many ways to buy real estate. I'm curious what you would recommend if somebody was either getting started or looking to grow their portfolio. I think it can be great to get started in the Midwest with the caveat that you find a big enough market. My market is so small that you get like, if people found out you're an owner from California, like they would be all you know, have their panties in a wad about it because it's so small town. And I find that when I post on Instagram, I'll see people in my like, for example, my town's investor Facebook page is like 80 people. And I'll see people like go into that page who follow me and like dip their toes in the water. And I just giggle because I'm like, you're not going to do anything in this market because it is so relationship based. But a bigger Midwest market, like maybe a capital city or a city over a million, like I think that could totally make sense. And for those listening, I would just say investing out of state is way harder to get started, but then you can scale it. Whereas I started DIY and for three years we were doing DIY. I literally had to move to Tucson to get out of DIY to grow my business. Mm, that's an interesting. Thing. So you had to move. That was the only way that was going to pull you apart. <laughs> the business is literally. like physically getting yourself away from there. That's yes. hilarious. Yeah. So um, I have a couple of questions, but I want to start here. You mentioned we we're talking about a lot of different deals and there's, there's so many steps to get a deal done, right? And I'm, I think there's some very um, novice listeners and then some people that are way ahead and way, you know, and then there's some beginners, right? So, but my point here is finding deals. And I think that's like one of the number one things for people. It's, it's great to have all these systems and processes in place, but what if you're struggling to find a deal? How do you, how do you get to that point? I think that's probably the number one skill set someone can have early on is, is underwriting and finding these deals. And, and obviously then it goes to negotiation, but take us through how you learned in the beginning and what mm -hmm. steps you took to actually, you know, uncover these deals. Mm -hmm. The very first house I bought was a love letter, but it was in my town, my very, very small town. And it, I knew the person. So that worked out. My second deal, it was a for, for rent sign. I called it the investor didn't know what property I was talking about. So I, the owner says so like, oh, he must be an investor. So I asked him, are you an investor? He was like, yeah. I was like, oh, me too. I was not, I didn't know anything. He sent me his whole property list. And then I said, show me your shittiest ones. I want to walk them. And so the moral of that story is one, call for rent signs. Two, say you're an investor. Like nobody knows. Don't, obviously don't be deceitful, but like call people, ask the questions. I remember I was so nervous talking on the phone to him and it was in front of my parents. We we're all in the car and I'll never forget that, but it got me a deal. And in fact, I actually bought two deals from him, uh, but I was just all over the place. I would do anything to find a deal, write letters, call people. Um, I joined Jen and Joe's program to do creative and yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. Let's talk about that. So um, a lot of people 
they'll come on the show and then we'll talk about their portfolio and how the success they've gotten. And, you know, a lot of times I think listeners think they just did it on their own and they went on YouTube and they went on bigger pockets, but uh, we've found through asking questions and uncovering more information that a lot of people have coaches that can mm-hmm. help guide the ship or at least put training wheels on the bike and, and kind of steer you in the right direction on the way up. So uh, we love Jen and Joe, just a caveat. They're actually our creative finance coaches as well and helping us with a couple of deals at the moment. But I want to chat through your journey and let's talk when you decided that coaching was right for you and then kind of how it impacted your journey. Yeah, I only had a few deals when I started their program in early 2021. And I started it because I knew I wanted to quit my job. And I was like, how am I going to buy properties if I quit my job? So I was like, I'm going to join this program. I'm going to take it super seriously and I'm going to figure it out. And I did. I've bought over 10 creative deals. It's by no means the main main way that I buy properties, but it's a tool in my tool belt. And it's been a very good tool to have in my tool belt. But I'd say if you're interested in coaching, just make sure, you you know, once you do put your money where your mouth is, you're going to get that ROI. What I don't want to see is people who sign up and think it's going to be magic and that it happens for them and they don't have to put any work into it. Yeah, that's a great caveat because I think a lot of people... How many coaching programs have we joined? So many. Well, yeah, like three or four. I think it's it's so interesting when you get into the room, you realize like, hey, there's it's not a magic pill that or a magic wand that you're going to wave and, and you get the end result. There's still a lot of work you have to put in and you have mm-hmm. to build relationships and uncover information. It's same thing with life, right? Just attack, pivot make changes, overcome obstacles, all the above. But for me, some of these programs um, have felt like information overload. And then you get in and you're like, whoa, like a couple of the ones that we we had to leave, we were just like, it was too much, too broad stroked everywhere. And it wasn't Mm -hmm. niched down and narrowed. And we're like, oh my God, like, how are we, which lane should I go in? I need like a personalized coach within the program to be like, (laughs) hey dude, read this, go to this module, do this, this, and this. So we found with Jen and Joe, it's like a little bit more streamlined and more one-on-one approach, like a simpler like a family. Yeah, it's simple. Yeah. It's, and I like their yeah. family approach where I just, I almost feel like I'm their kid at this point. Not that we're like, like too far off in age, but with, when we have these conversations, they're like, you did what? And they're like, <laughs> they're like, uh, yeah. How much have... did you spend on coaching yeah, before? Uh? Exactly. And, like, and they're oh. like, oh, they care. They're like, you know, and it, there's a different level there. So, um, I say that all in all in all, not to, to push this program, but in general, there's, so many different ways to run a program. There's group coaching calls, there's one-on-one, there's daily coaching, and then there's, and then there's courses, modules, and things within. I think if the, the point here is if you're going to take the step to put your money where your mouth is, as, as you say, and like spend money on yourself, it's like, take it serious. I think the biggest, one of the biggest struggles for people is they get into, or at least for us, let's say we were busy professionals. We're also running the podcast and our real estate business. And then we added in a big, another chunk time suck, which mm-hmm. is coaching. And we're like, whoa, we get all the systems ironed out and that's up to us to implement. And when it comes down to like cold calling, you're like, whoa, we don't have time. We have no time in the day. We have to hire this. And this is just like one obstacle we had to overcome and learn from. And then there's other ways to do it. And we're like, oh, you can run ads. Oh, you can you can run this through Facebook groups and we can mm-hmm. type on our time versus having to call people. It's just like things you can do while doing other things. So um, make sure back to circling back to your point is like, you have to, if you're going to spend the money, don't just go in and sit on these calls and expect to have the answer at the end. You have to go take action and try things. Yeah. It's not going to work every time. And you're just going to learn through doing which we all have done through real estate investing. It's, it's all trial by fire. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, their program talking about creative a little bit and, and maybe you can give us an example of a, it doesn't have to be a creative deal, maybe like a deal that you've done a a, a fun one. And the reason why I brought up creative and I think Jen and Joe's program is great is because the way that we feel is the best way to buy real estate in 2024, moving into 2025 is creative finance. Mm -hmm. The reason why we say that is because we bought property in 2020 and 2021 and we have invested in property on interest rates with 3% and it's amazing. But I'm not going to teach somebody that like that's not going to work. Now, the reason it's not going to work is because you can't get an interest rate that like that anymore. But you can call direct to owners and get great deals out there of people that have a ton of equity in their home or maybe they don't have a ton of equity, but they need to get out of it. And you can subject to we feel like creative finance is the best way to buy real estate moving forward. Um, and having somebody in your arsenal and your tool belt, like you said, having coaches that are like, this is just one of the ways that you can do it. You know, you just mentioned half of your deals about, or a third are, are that way. 
talk to us about either one of those deals or another one and like maybe give us some some numbers on it and and how they that played out because i was looking we just rye was typing on his calculator we did some math 26 units you know a few hundred dollars a month in cash flow like you're you know you're up at this close to ten thousand dollars a month just from those units not even counting your flips Mm -hmm. in four years like to do that i that gets people excited so i'd love to hear give us not to cut him off but give us your best creative deal and and kind of how you put it together if you can because i think it just gives a peek behind the curtain of what's possible because everyone is like oh i just gotta save up my money deploy it into a deal wait a couple more years save more money dump it in so there's other ways to do it just Mm -hmm. please give us an example there was a lead that i had of a couple who got who unexpectedly inherited a house it assessed for 70k on the assessor site they were really stuck on this 70k they had a few flippers walk in and offer them half that about thirty five thousand. then i got a hold of them from a word of mouth referral. And I knew they were really stuck on this 70K. So I told them, I'll give you 70K, double what everybody else is gonna give you, but I need these terms. I'm not giving you down payment, 0% interest, 10 years, amortized over 30 and 300 bucks principal a month. I turned around, I rent it for 999. So I make $700 a month on rent to own cash flow. Because it's rent to own, I don't have any expenses. And in 10 years, my balloon will be 34 grand, but it'll probably be worth at least 100. I'll have cash flowed 700 times 12 times 10. So, like a 30 some thousand dollars. Then I'll sell it and make an additional probably $60,000. Um, so, that was definitely one of my best deals. And I remember when I did it, Joe was like, have you done the numbers on this? Do you realize how good of a deal this is? I was like, I don't know. I just glad that they said yes to creative financing. I haven't really done the math. (laughs) I mean that, yeah, the, the, the multiple paydays of rent to own is like so powerful. I'm, I'm curious. Oh, and my down payment, I got a down payment for 10 grand and paid zero. So then I made that right off the from the rent to own buyer. Exactly. Yeah. I want to know why, and this is, we'll give people context when they're talking to sellers. Why did they agree to it? And like, what was their Mm -hmm. thing to me, it just hearing it from the outside, looking in, there's thinking, I want to get top dollar for my property and I can, I don't need the cash right now. Is that kind of the, you know, the the way. And when you, when you answer that, I just want to give a caveat. One of the the number one objections when we're on some of these calls is I rather just go to, I rather just use a realtor because that's what everyone does, right? They, They don't know anything else. And they almost feel like, is this a scam? Like, what do you mean? Like you're, you're an investor. I, you're going to just, we're just going to sign a deal with it with an attorney. I've never even heard of this. So mm-hmm. it's the education piece too. So I'm curious if you could talk to his question, but also talk about like overcoming the objections of creative finance from the seller's perspective. Mm-hmm. To that, I always just say it's super common. I leave it at that. I don't need to educate you on how common it is, but a lot of times people just want to hear you give solutions and make them feel better. So when you're like, Oh, it's super common. It'll be stress-free. A lot of times they take you at word. Obviously, you need to still protect them and do everything right and do the right paperwork. But they're not here to be educated on what creative financing is and all these different things. And I remember when I first started, I had this lady looking up rap mortgage on Google and Joe got on a closing call with me and this lady. And she started, you know, reading something off Google. And after the call, Joe goes, now, Grace, how does she know what a rap mortgage is? And I was like, my bad, I might have had her on Google. Like, you don't need to have them on Google learning about these things. You need to be the expert and make them feel good and be able to sleep at night. And then why they wanted to sell it, they were stuck on that 70K. And I remember I was so nervous to give them these terms. But I also asked them, like, what would you take for a down? Like, what's the lowest you would do? What's the lowest payment? And I also say principal, not 0% interest. That's just code for 0% interest. And then when I gave this offer, I'll never forget. She was like, this sounds incredible. And I was like, really? Like, that's crazy. I was so nervous. But it's because she knew I would do all the paperwork. They'd leave it as is, leave all their stuff in it. And it would be really easy. I know that feeling. Uh, it's hard to explain what the feeling is. And I, I don't know it from your exact example, but I remember, you know, getting, making a ton of offers on places. Right. And then you finally get one accepted and you're like, no way. Like, like you almost, you're, you go through the motions and so many different loopholes and you're like, we got it. Like we're good. Mm-hmm. And then 
I don't know if you feel this way, but it's so funny when you have so many deals cycling through the pipeline or, or properties you want to buy. This is kind of goes with people just looking to buy a primary home too. You, you're like making the, I don't know if you do this, but I almost make like a false scenario in my head of like a dream, like, Oh, what it would be like to have that property and like what it could do for me. And like picturing, like putting different furniture in it. And then you don't even get the property. Like, okay, on to the next. It's like, it's this emotional roller coaster. It's just kind of funny. Yeah, to talk that's where they say not to invest with emotion, but it's really hard to do. It's that's hard. You got to shut that off. Hard. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially in Airbnbs. Well, that's, that's, that's another great point is that like you, we, we've done a, a, a bunch of different strategies and like the Airbnb is like the short term rental game is like you kind of get emotional about it because you can picture your guests in there. And it's 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 a very different game. That's kind of like two different avenues. But I know people that have bought creative deals in good markets and you know, furnish them and put them on Airbnb. So the, the reason why we love real estate so much is because you can create your own niche. I, I guarantee if I search this right now, I could find somebody, the creative Airbnb guy. And that's the guy who buys mm -hmm. deals creatively and puts them on Airbnb. Or, you know, it's just like, there's so many ways to do it. And to have the different tools in your tool belt, it, it just gets you prepared for different scenarios. And, and like, have you ever like, you know, come across deals that you've wholesaled or anything do you have, have you ever t you know, tapped into that because it doesn't fit for a flip or doesn't fit for a you know a, a sub two or, or something sub, like yeah that. yeah i wholesaled a handful of deals back when i was doing their coaching i don't love sales so i stopped doing it and it was one of those things that i was just like why can't i just do this like i made such good money off these few first few and then when i finally was just like you know this is just not my thing i then went and figured out how to create a flipping business so that's I could right. see why people would think that wholesaling is a little unethical. I don't think it's unethical personally. I don't think it's unethical. I but just... I could see why people would like have that kind of like not disclosing how much you're made, you know, so, you know, and if you can't create great relationships with people that are wholesaling and you're flipping, it can be a win-win for everyone, everyone in the scenario, but sometimes people get screwed. So it's just, it's interesting. I, yeah, I think, I think for me, it was hard because I don't trust other people to make money on it. And so then when you guys are asking about people who come in from out of state, I wholesaled to one person who came in from out of state and then did terrible on the deals. Cause, and I didn't know this till years later, but I don't trust people to like know their own numbers. I'm like, I'll risk on myself and on me. I feel bad if I sell something to you and you don't make money because you don't know your numbers, which is that, really dumb, but that's an interesting one. It's funny. I was like, how did you even know about the end result of that one? Unless you follow somebody along. told me who knew her like two years later. And I was like, Oh my gosh, of course now I feel terrible. <laughs> yeah. I trust me. I, I get that. We know. Yeah, we know there's uh there's okay. So I want, I'm still on the creative topic and I think it's, it's interesting. It's basically just like when we say creative finance, it's just like ways to buy real estate without having to go to the bank and, and a couple other things as well. Right. But you kind of can create the deal um, in your back pocket and, and going off market. I want to talk about the the different steps, I guess, to a deal. Like there's, there's lead gen marketing acquisitions, then dispo. Can you kind of take us through that? And the one that I really want to hit on is lead gen. And the reason the pain point for us, cold calling, and we've done this and there's, you know, I think a lot of people leave this in no matter what we've hired the VAs to go do it. And what we have found just as a, a caveat to this whole thing is, a lot of people are getting the calls from the same types of, of buyers. And they're like, listen, I have had 40, 50 calls today. I'm, I'm just going to go with a realtor. Blah, blah, blah. Like it's easier for me. And so to me, okay, they're just not motivated. Like we didn't find the right person. Right. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping you could take us through that. And then, you know, talk about some of the different exit strategies kind of as Corey alluded to where, Hey, like maybe this isn't a right fit for rent to own. Maybe, maybe I off it as a wholesaler to one of my friends, that's an investor that, it, the numbers do pencil out, right? It is a good deal. So just kind of take us through the steps for people that are kind of not too privy to the information. Yeah, for lead gen, my biggest thing, again, I'm in a smaller market, so it is a lot different. I've never cold called. I've never paid for direct mail. I've never paid for any marketing ever because I have such a strong brand recognition in my market. But I have this Facebook page. I post stupid photos of me and my team and my renos. And you wouldn't believe how many deals I've gotten from that Facebook page. I'm buying a property right now from a guy who I know only because he follows my Facebook page because he likes before and after photos and has followed it for three years. His dad passed away. And what do you know? He calls me. He's like, you don't know me, but I've followed you for three years and I want to sell my house to you. I'm like, okay, great. Uh, but some other lead gen that I would do 
is um, telling other investors and realtors your exact buy box and even educating them on how you can buy a property creatively. I think it's huge. If you can be super concise with your buy box, it brings a level of seriousness and trustworthiness. That's like, okay, this person knows what they want and what they're talking about. Mm. Another fun, creative thing I'm doing. I'm actually going to go speak at a brokerage in my market about how realtors can sell and buy creatively for their clients. And that's going to benefit me twofold. One, I love teaching. I love being on stage and talking to people. And two, I'm going to now become known for the person who can buy those. So you bet when they go have their first deal that they don't know how to put together, they're going to call me and I'm probably going to buy it. Yep. So those That's are a few great. creative things. Obviously, you can call old Zillow listings and Craigslist and Facebook, Facebook groups, all that good stuff too. Yeah, that's what we were doing. We were calling on expired, withdrawn, and canceled listings, and it was a shit show. I mean, it. by the way, I say this, it works. If you do it, it works. If you stick through it, if you do it for two, three years, you're going to get deals. It works. It's just like the time allocation for us. We're like, shit, this is going to take forever. And and the other things that we're doing so the the facebook and the the more digital aspect going into t the years that we're in i just feel like it's it's there's a lot of other ways to do it so yeah yeah mm -hmm. i think as you kind of keep it tracking us along here with the the acquisition and dispo and, and then you know other exit strategies basically it was the lead generation i was just curious how you did it and then acquisitions like acquiring the property and then really dispoing it out right like how do you when, at what point do you build your list? And then I don't know what stage it's in within within how your wheelhouse, but I'm just thinking of these exit strategies. And maybe it's like as you analyze a deal and you ask specific questions to prospective sellers, it's like, mm, they answered this way. I think I should go to this strategy. And it's it's kind of what what do you have in your tool belt that you can pivot people yeah. towards if it's not a right fit for rent to own, for example? Yeah. Okay. So for acquisitions, when it comes to figuring out what I'm going to do with it, I want to try to keep it. When I was wholesaling, I would wholesale in a different market about an hour away. And that's what made it really easy in my brain. If it's in Waterloo, it's a wholesale. If it's in Cedar Rapids, I'm going to try to buy it or maybe wholesale it if I couldn't. Maybe I wholesale like one there. Um, and then when it comes to figuring out if I'm going to keep it, I know my metrics. I know I need to have 15% cash on cash, but in reality, I really would like a perfect burr. But if I'm doing a burr, that means that I probably just need short-term creative financing. So lately I've done a few where I'll be like, hey, just give me one year because the property's probably crap. So I have to dump a bunch of money into it and then I'll refi it to get all my capital out. If somebody has a property that they're willing to give me a long time on, I'm probably going to try to see how can I put as little money in it as possible to keep my cash input down and hold it. And I have a fourplex right now where it could maybe be turnkey as like a C-class rental. It could be. It could be totally turnkey as a C-class rental. And he's willing to hold it for a few years, which doesn't move the needle that much. Or I could tell him, hey, just give me a year. I'm going to gut the whole thing and make them really nice MTR units. So, but that's hard to analyze because I have like, I could buy it two different ways. I could rent it two different ways and I could refi or sell or keep it two different ways. So now I'm analyzing six different scenarios and it, it gets overwhelming sometimes. So that's why it's nice to have your buy box, know your metrics so you can cut different scenarios out yeah. immediately off the bat. Yeah, that's great. We use podcasts to learn about the strategies and then the best way to implement them and figure out how to do it on your own is coaching. And so if you're looking to be, if you're listening to the podcast and you're looking to be taught and how, you know, hopefully have a portfolio like you do, we have a link book a call with Jen and Joe because they're great. They're teaching us. They're teaching you. We have a few other people that they've taught and they have this community and it's like, it's just, it makes it so much easier. So I just want to throw that out there. But before did you have anything else on that? I wanted to talk about the, the link wire. is in the show notes and then show notes. also in the, in our link in our bio on in our, Instagram. On Instagram. Yeah. yeah. At Wealth Juice uh, Official. Yeah. Quick, uh, quick caveat. It looks like there, it always appears that they have a, a wait list. So when you click the link, just click on the top, right? It says book a call and it might say like join wait list. It's open right now. So just you'll, you'll get on their calendar. I just wanted to point that yeah, out because yeah, as all. I was navigating through like the, the journey of w us going through it, uh, that was the way, but cool. it will confirm your call. So, as we wind down the show here a little bit, um, Grace, I want to talk about the wire. Like, you know, 
your community. And, and we've interviewed so many like amazing women that invest in real estate. I mean, I just name a few like Ashley. I don't know if you know Ashley Hamilton. She's amazing in Detroit. Soli, Jen, mm-hmm. yourself. Ashley Wilson. Ashley Wilson. Her community. Yeah. So there's, I mean, it's just like the numbers are staggering. And, and, I, and I, I'm wondering what was your motivation for it? What do you do? Like give us the, the, the picture of what the WIRE community is about. And by the way, WIRE stands for Women Investing, invest in, in, real, real, investing in Real Estate. Investing yep. in real estate. How about, two how, eyes. Wait, you tell us. Yeah. Go ahead. Women invest in real estate. Women invest in real estate. There you go. Because I think women investing in real estate, that domain was taken or something like I that. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Wire started what I had like, I was under contract for my first deal. So I hadn't even bought anything. And I put on my goals for 2021. I'm going to start a women's meetup because selfishly, I don't know anybody in my life who's trying to do this. And this is what I want to do. I put out a Zoom link on Instagram. And like 30 or 40 women showed up and I was like, what the heck? Like, what's going on? This is crazy. All these people I don't know just showed up to my meeting to hang out and network. And Amelia was one of those people. She was like the speaker for that meeting. And then we clicked right away and I was like, hey, let's do this together. So for like a whole year, it was just a free online meetup. Then we started doing retreats that went amazing. Three or four days in a mansion with a bunch of other women. We have courses, mastermind, podcasts, blah, 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 blah. But the best tip I want to give people is community makes such a difference. And like Jen Delafave, she came to one of our retreats. She's coming to a second one, which is funny because it's like she was my mentor. Now she's coming to my retreat. But as you get to a certain level of business, you'll realize it's the people that you know, not what you know. Obviously, when you're first getting started, you have to figure out how to analyze property and sell it and rent it. But then at a certain point, it's your community. And like you guys were just talking about with your community, that's really where big business happens. So if you're listening, be a part of a community somehow, some way. I would say that it's not only about the money and the big business happening, although you're 100% right on that. It's about like at the end of the day, we're talking about houses and brick and, and wood the the fun part is enjoying yeah. it with the people that you can enjoy it with. Like that's really, and like if you got down to anybody's why of why they do it, like it's not to have more fucking money or shit in, in your house. It's mm-hmm. to, to be able to have experiences with people, you know? So like you can do it both at the same time when you're in a community. And that's what I love about it. It's like, not only am I building this wealth and like, you know, uh-huh. the whole like go silent, you know, go stealth mode. It's like, that's not even fun, dude. Like it's the fun part yeah. is to be like, damn, like look what you did over there. Like I just think of Jesse, like supporting his journey, like watching him do his thing. And it's like, that is the coolest thing that like having multiple communities, being in multiple communities, have, having input to give to people, being known as a giver or somebody who wants to help other mm-hmm. people. Like that's really what your end, you know, legacy is going to be. How do you make people feel? And we love the people aspect of it. Hence, you know, are interviewing people, 250 episodes. Yeah. I, I love this. I think, um, for us, I think that was one of the reasons we started the podcast. We're like, well, how can we get around people that are doing what we want to do back in the day when we had no properties and organically networking. And then you get to a point where, as Corey mentioned, like the house is a house, right? Like at the end of the day, it's a good vehicle to help you get towards retirement or to live a life that you want to, to live earlier. And then I, it builds wealth. Right. But along the way you realize, there's people that are doing it much better than you are. There's people that are always interested in it, but getting in those rooms, like there's purpose behind, I don't know how to explain it, but like going through the journey and just getting there at the end of the day, you get to the end of the the journey and the destination. You're like, well, did I have fun doing it? Like, did I, did I uplift people around me? And I think some people are going through their nine to five life and they're like, man, I keep hearing these podcasts and I want to get around these people. I don't know what to do. It sounds so exciting and fun. And people are like doing this. Half of the battle isn't for the real estate. Half of the half of it's to go through the through the trials, tribulations with Corey because we're doing this together. And people are like, you're so lucky you have a partner that wants to do what you want to do because I've been searching for that, right? And I'm and I'm like, I am, I know. Mm-hmm. And I think what we've realized recently is like we have this community, but we haven't like we want to get further in in depth with them. It's like, how can we like partner in deals together? How can we? What are, we're learning about what other people are doing, and it's funny we've reached our level of su- success because of the other people we've met through this podcast, including like you and Jen and Joe, and like just as perfect little small examples, but to build that community and go on those retreats with people, you're seeing the names on your Instagram 
that they're actually the real people behind those and that have the incredible stories and just sharing those. You can, I don't know the quote. It's, it's something about like a boat rising or the tide rising altogether. I, I don't know. I, I try a, to a tide rises all ships or something, something like that. Well, it's but terrible. I think about it, it's like the, the movement, right? And like yeah. the culture piece that you mentioned in the community, like you're all fighting the same fight together. And that's half the fun is like spending time with those people. Even if you're not tackling a deal together, just being able to talk about it and mm -hmm. It's almost like therapeutic in a way. It's kind of what it you're like, therapy. wow, <laughs> I think about all this shit all the time. And I'm like, finally, I can just offload it on my people that get it. And we've had so many people reach out to us and be like, dude, I'm just trying to find my people. Like, how do I get around them? So yeah. we started our community. I'm not sure exactly when this episode will air, but take a look at our Instagram and you'll find the link somewhere if you want to join our community. And we're like, kind of like the Wire community. We're trying to build something where, hey, we're no longer just the voices leading your podcast that you listen to weekly, or you're checking out our motivational tweets on Instagram. It's like, how can we actually meet the real people and impact lives? And some people are probably doing 10 times better than we are. Jump in the community. We'll have them teach you. And that's, what's exciting about us. It's like, how can we kind of put a force field around this thing and like all elevate together and, and kind of go on this, on this journey together versus just specs along the way. So kudos to you for building it and even starting it before you had a, a big portfolio and, I think uh, from us joining a bunch of other masterminds and things like that, it's we've had we have the most fun being kind of on the other side, and then bringing our people that are experts in to kind of lead calls and things like that because we vetted them, we trust them, and we know they're doing it the right way. And so um, exciting things in the future. I think community is the number one thing to to scale a business and also to elevate your life. Right? You it takes one person. I, this pros and cons, but it takes one person to one conversation to make you become rich or to change your life forever. Um, so just giving yourself the opportunity to do so, I think we've all found that through our communities and it's just been exciting. So I don't know if you have more than that, but how could I have more than that? That was amazing. So, um, either, it, you know, either look into Grace's community if you're listening and, and I, I'm assuming you don't have any guys in the community, hence women invest in real estate. But so if you're, if you're a, a lady, a woman listening, think about her community. We, we take all different types of people, but I think there's something about having like people that are focusing on maybe even more niche down for you, like focusing on the same thing. And I think that it's powerful to see other women doing this as well as you've done it and, and growing it. So the last couple questions I have for you as we'll wrap up, you've made set like your journey is so interesting because you started so young and I love asking the question, like, what would you ask your 18 year old self or what, what would you tell your 18 year old self? Um, you know, I'm still going to ask it because I'd like to know if you, not that you would change anything, but if you had advice, maybe somebody who's listening, they don't even have to be 18. They could be 27. They could be 35, but they're just starting out in this journey. What advice would you go back and give yourself if you, if you had that opportunity? You have great personal finances. That was a huge foundation for me. My sister made me track how much money I spent in college and I hated her for it, but then it made, it was, it laid the foundation for this. Um, and then I think the other piece is just like, you truly can do whatever the heck you want to do. And that's something my parents instilled in me. Like you can be whatever you want to be. You can do whatever you want to do. I was just telling Amelia this yesterday. Like, I feel like I'm somebody, if I say, I'm going to go live four months in Columbia, I'm going to go do it. Like, I know that I have, I truly understand my free will and that I can do whatever I want in my life. Obviously there's some fine print to that, but I just wish other people understood that more and that you really do have the reins to your own life. And even if you do have a nine to five job, which my partner does, he went from real estate back to a nine to five job. But something we're going to do is next summer, he has a planned quit. Like he's going to quit and we're going to go for four months and live somewhere. And then he's going to come back and get another job. Like you can still do that. You can still make it up. You can still do whatever you want, even if you do work in corporate America. Amazing. I, uh, Chad Carson, somebody that comes to mind because he was the yes, first person I that taught. Him. Yeah. He's the best. <laughs> he's the best. He was the first person that took a chance on our show. It's a story for another day, but he also taught us about these mini retirements. It's like, everyone is just focused on, focused on getting this, this, end goal of like, oh, I can't wait to retire. And it's like, you've all these muscles that you've built up to try to get you there. It's just, you're not going to be able to do it. So take the vacations along the way and take the, take the wins. And, and, and we, I honestly feel like I've gotten better at that. Like if I want to, I'll go play golf at three o'clock on a Monday. Like I'll do it because this, I only have one of these lives. I'm going to work my ass. I'll probably come home and work till 11. Right. But it's like, I'm not gonna, 
I'm not going to limit myself and say, I, I, I can't wait till I'm 55. I can do, mm-hmm. do whatever I want. It's like, that's, I don't think life's meant to be lived like that. So I love the fact that you're going to take in, you know, your late twenties, I don't know how old your partner is, you know, but your late twenties and you're going to go travel for four months because you can, you've built that you've, you've earned the muscle that has allowed you to put the, the things in place before you chime in. I just want to say one thing about the, the personal finance. It is so hard to change a habit when you have two or three kids. I don't say this from experience. I just say it from seeing other people. I don't have kids. Rye has one. To turn back the tail, turn back time and say, oh, I, I, if, I ha- if I made more money now, I would, I would do this. That's not how it works. It's mm-hmm. starting the foundation early and saying, if I can live, I li- we, we lived off $35,000 like, and, we, and we, tr- we save money. You know? So it's easier for us to do it when we're making mo- six figures because we we have the muscle that has taught us to do that. So the earlier you can start, I'm not saying it's impossible. We actually would love to help people f- figure out ways to do that. But the personal finance early, as early as you can. It's just hard when you have three kids and you're like, you have this lifestyle that you have to maintain. If you can do it earlier, it's a lot easier. Yeah. And I think I want to just make this known. Like It doesn't really matter where you're at in your journey. You can always make a decision to change. But not making the decision, it's taking action for that. So you mentioned something about free will. And I think that's, I just love putting that phrase out there. I think people forget that they have that. They're so bound and chained to their job or to their routine, right? And you're like, oh, well, I'm just going through the motion. I have a significant other. Maybe she doesn't want to do this. Maybe, well, have you asked? Have you talked about it? Or like, oh, I have a kid now. I'm good. I just got to keep saving, saving for retirement. Like spend some of your money. Like if you've done it the right way and you have a foundation, say you you got a hundred grand saved up and it's just sitting in your checking account. Take 10 and go on an amazing vacation. You will never regret it once. Mm -hmm. You know, you like truly something you see what's out in the world and, and you're like, it just gives you perspective. And also I think when you experience loss or someone close to you is no longer here, you realize how finite things are. And it takes you to hit that. You're like, Whoa, like I, I have been lucky for this amount of years to have no BS go on or limited. Why did I not do a little bit more living? I think there's a lot of us out there that, we're so type A, we're so focused, we're saving, we're com- compound interest, <laughs> 7 million bucks by this age, like I'm good, dude. I'll, f- I'll buy the Lambo at that point, I'll buy the house at this point, I'll, I'll take the trips then. Your life's infinitely more complicated the older you get and the more you add kids to the mix, yeah. you add assets to the mix, you add business partners to the mix. It's like, just cherish some of your freedom early and like don't forget to live in the moment. I think for me, we plan, I- I've been using this a lot lately, but a lot of people plan their life around their job, right? And I think it's backwards. A society has trained us for that. Going to school has trained us for that. And it's like, oh, I got to go. To, well, I got school from na- na- from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then I have my freedom. Like, I get that. It's instilled in us for years. But now you have the freedom. Like, think about a little bit more hybrid, even if you have to go to a job and you need to sustain income. Maybe you have a, a Monday, Friday, work from home. Maybe you can get a, a remote yeah. job where you have to work all the time. There's things out there. Don't pigeonhole yourself. I think it's like, you got to take control of your life and realize no one's coming to save you, but then also start planning your job around your life. If that makes sense, like stop planning around this thing that can like what you cut did. you tomorrow. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. I- kind of what you did and took, took really the free will seriously. Cause I think people think that they're like, Oh yeah, you know, I can't do that. Yes, you can. It's going to, it's going to cost some sacrifice and maybe it'll cost you some dollars, but Maybe you'll be way happier. It's that fear that holds us down there, right? And I think we all go through that. I think it's super normal. So Yeah, I think that's one thing I've done well. I've always picked freedom over money. I don't make it anything crazy. I could. I, you know, we run these boot camps in wire that make a lot of money. We do them maybe once a year because we don't want to do it more. I make I do a lot of flips, but I only work part time because I want to work part time. And I've always picked having freedom. I just got back from Europe for two weeks. I didn't open my email once over the money because I want to live my life. That's yeah. I mean, that's a great way to end the show. That is so true. Freedom over money. And because there's never, there's never, there's never, it's never going to end grace. It's never going to end. If you put money first, it never will. There'll be somebody that's making more, somebody that has more of a higher net worth. And then guess what? You die and you maybe pass it on your kids and that could be cool. But it's like, if you never spend it or use it, I mean, They'd want to spend it time with you. Exactly. I, one last thing I'll say that, that thing. annoys me is like, this is a weird one, but like I've seen some people have this, like they're old money, right? Let's just think about this. Like maybe our parents are like, even before they're like grandparents, right? They keep saving these lump sums of money and then like, oh, don't worry. You're going to have this great 
you're gonna you guys will be set up when I pass away. It's like, dude, I want to do that <laughs> shit with you. Like, I don't I don't want to wait. You know, like let's spend some of this together now. Like, what are we doing? I just feel like it's such a weird concept. It's always pushing things to the future. You don't, and that's why insurance is a great business and there's other things like they're like, well, people are just going to keep doing the same shit and keep kicking it down the line. Wealth planning. Exactly. So I just say that to take, take time to like map out your year and what you want to do ahead of time. And don't like say, Ooh, well I'm working this date. So I can't do this. Like maybe, maybe shift focus a little bit. And I think if you can kind of work towards mapping and building out your life and things that you want to do, it'll change the decisions you make elsewhere, elsewhere and, and kind of, yep. you'll find, you put it on the universe and, and you can, once you do that, once you say you want to be a real estate investor, right? You get yourself around the room and the universe kind of aligns the stars. It's the same way with anything you want. So I'm just throwing that out there, plan out your life. Don't get sucked into the job. We're normally tired before we do these podcasts. And by the end, we're like ready to go. So this is, <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, so <laughs> anyway, Grace, this is awesome. I don't want to hold you any longer. I think it was cool to get to know you. I really appreciate your time. If people want to learn more about you, they want to join your community, they want to network, they want to you know, end up in rooms that you're in, which I, I would want to do if I was listening. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you? With me at grace.investing on Instagram or with wire at womeninvestinrealestate.com. Cool. Awesome. Grace, this was a fun one. As Corey mentioned, we do tend to get a little too excited at the end of the episodes. <laughs> now I'm not going to be able to sleep, but it's a good thing. So I'm glad we have you uh, part of the community, part of the network now. And it's a pleasure. Congratulations on your book, your story, your life. You're doing amazing things. And you're inspiring others. And I think uh, that's one filled with purpose and passion. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. you guys. Thanks for tuning in this week to the Weekly Juice Podcast. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, and share with friends. The more ratings we get, the more ears we'll get on our show. And in turn, we'll be able to provide you with more high-quality guests. You can also find us on Instagram at Weekly Juice Pod, where we post daily tips and tricks and document our own journey towards financial freedom. Make sure to tune in every Wednesday to get your weekly juice.